welcome on this beautiful Sunday, May 1st. Uh, it's a joy to be here and to see everyone. Welcome to this holy hour of praise, worship, and opportunity to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. May we each be inspired to follow your steps more lovingly and more boldly. Amen. Uh, announcements. Um, there is a National Day of Prayer celebration on Thursday, May 5th. The information is on the blue page in your bulletin. Um, there's a fellowship breakfast at Palace Diner this coming Saturday, May 7th at 9. All are welcome. Uh, May 14th. Oh, May 14th. Okay, it says 7th. Oh. Okay. Disregard in the bulletin, it says May 7th. It's May 14th. <laughs> but if you go in the seventh year, <laughs> you'll be by yourself. Um, there's a container in the narthex for items for the gift. Um, so please donate to that. Does anybody have any other announcements? Oh, yes, on the other side of the blue is family night, May 11th, 6 to 7.30, all are welcome. There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Any other announcements? Okay, let's take a moment to greet one another and say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, our call to worship. The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. The Lord sits in front upon cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion and is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is the Lord. Trudy will come lead us in our praise songs. You want to stand up if you're able, please? everybody. That was amazing singing. <laughs> In unison, our invocation, Almighty God, open our hearts and minds to your word today. Help us to turn all our cares over to you and allow your spirit to work within us. In the name of Jesus, the Christ, we pray. Amen. And Trudy will come and lead us in our hymn, I Am Thine, O Lord. In the first and second verses.
You may be seated. And as we come to our prayer concerns, on the back of the bulletin uh, are two, uh, Connie Weatherhead, to pray for her grandson in Arizona. Uh, is there any update, Connie? Connie, an update on your grandson? Okay. And also for Florence Craig, are there any other prayer requests? I have Trid praise. I had those nodules in my lungs, and I went for my follow-up uh, CAT scan, and they're gone. Fantastic. Amen. Uh, and, uh, Lynn? I'm praying that John is getting better, but continue prayers for him. He has a test on Wednesday. Hopefully everything will come out well with that. And also prayers for my uh, son-in-law, Eric, who is unemployed again. It's just, that job didn't work out, and he is now looking for another job. And I'm praying that all the babies, and both babies are doing great. <laughs> Fantastic. Any, oh. Um, continued prayer for my brother, Dennis. He's undergoing chemo. Okay, Doris's brother, Dennis. I have one more praise that Doris's birthday is day, day after tomorrow. <gasps> Happy birthday! Happy birthday, should we sing? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for that. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Doris. Happy birthday to you. Yay! <laughs> Any other prayer requests? Uh, my brother, uh, Richard, Dick. Uh, he was, who lives out of Western Pennsylvania. He was just diagnosed with uh, COVID okay. uh, about 10 days ago. But he, he's doing well and he has no, uh, uh, hardly any symptoms, but uh, he's still you know, is in need of prayer. So. Uh, if you didn't hear that, Bob's brother, Dick Muse, was diagnosed with COVID. He doesn't have really too many symptoms, but he still needs, the, needs prayer. Anyone else? Jose. For our travel, we're leaving in Hawaii to Virginia. To Virginia? Yes. Meet our daughter. Oh, nice. How wonderful. Travel mercies for Jose and Paula as they travel to Virginia. Anyone else? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together on this beautiful day, the day you have made for us to celebrate, to celebrate you and your love for us. We know that you have heard each of these prayer requests, and I also know that you know the unspoken ones. And we, we ask you to put your healing hand on all of those that need it, and also to give peace to those that are struggling in some manner. We ask all of this in your name, who taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's time for our offering. We'll ask Bob to come take the offering.
Father, we thank you for these gifts that have been given, that they be blessed and used to glorify your name and to, to spread the good word of, of your joy and of your gifts to us. In your name, amen. Amen. morning's reading is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judah, Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your body of people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went into the house. He went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus.
Amen. Thank you, Betty. Seems like every time when the old man is here preaching, uh, you have uh, 25 pages of scripture that's being read. So, John, good to see you. We've been praying for you. And God bless you for coming today. Thank you. If in the middle of any of this, if I'm getting a little long for you, don't hesitate. You can just <laughs> go out and get your cup of coffee or whatever you need yeah, to do. So, yeah. Yeah. We don't we're, we're, go line, right? <laughs> we're, we're glad you're here. God bless you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful passage of Scripture. And... Uh, uh, it's the kind of uh, passage that excites me to just go on and preach on and on and on and on. But I've got a wife over here that's going to, I think they used to say, in the, when I was in one of my churches in Canada, we're going to get a little trap door <laughs> behind the pulpit. And if you want to extend something too long, we'll just, you know, press the button of the trap door and you'll fall right down. So I don't know whether Carol has something lined up or not, but anyway, we're delighted to be here again with you, and uh, let's pray together. Lord God, you've promised to, to meet those who seek your face. Come now and reveal your presence to us as we make ourselves present to you. Lord, we seek your face. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen and amen. This is May 1. Happy May Day. It's also the uh, third Sunday of Easter. And our message this morning is entitled, The Enemy Becomes My Brother. The Enemy Becomes My Brother. The general theme of this week in the reading that I've been doing is, The Lord is with us. The emphasis of this reading that I've been doing this week is on the fact that the early believers needed to be reminded to focus on one important truth, that even though the Lord Jesus had left the earth bodily and ascended to the Father, his work and his ministry were continuing through his followers and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that uh, the attempt to keep the early church focused on that truth is the same point that the Lord wants us to focus on today. Luke, uh, the grand physician, he set out partly to keep the promise of Jesus, and you remember Jesus' words before he was ascended to heaven. I am with you always, he said, even to the ends of the age. So Luke is attempting in the book of Acts to address this uh, issue and to keep reminding uh, his readers in the early church that Jesus was still alive and active in the world. And he wrote this book of Acts to his Gentile friend just to remind his Gentile friend that God was indeed still working in the world. So Luke tells us about the recorded historical events that followed soon after Jesus' departure, and those events were real, they were exciting. And so I'm here this morning, uh, the Lord wants me to be here uh, this morning before you to proclaim again, Jesus may be gone, he may have gone to the Father, but he is still alive, he is still spiritually here, he is still present with us in the power of the Spirit. And if we believe that, and I certainly believe that, we need to all say, Amen. 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 So here we are in Berlin, 
May 1st, 2022, and the Lord is with us. The scripture reading today in Acts 9 is long, but I think it's a wonderful and a vivid uh, reminder of that truth. I would just want to do a short recap, if we could, we don't have time to, I would love to do a recap of the whole book of Acts for us this morning, but we don't have time for that. So, but it's just a short recap to remind us how the Lord was active uh, in, in the, the early part and, and, and through the writings of Luke in the book of Acts. Remember that after Jesus was taken up to heaven, the Holy Spirit then quickly goes to work. There's the Pentecost event and the power of the Spirit is on all those who are gathered together. Then Peter gives this great long sermon, a long sermon. I think it was probably at that point, Peter uh, showed his colors that he was a true Baptist. Thousands are converted. Uh, Peter then goes out and, and heals a leper. Stephen is called and, and Stephen preaches a great message. And of course they disliked what Stephen preached so much that they killed him. So, and we can continue to read through the stories in Acts and be reminded again and again how Luke was telling us that God was still active in the world. Jesus was not there bodily, but God was still active there in the world. And then we come to the story in Acts 9 where Saul encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. God is still working, and he's working overtime with this uh, rascal, Saul. So Jesus uh, reveals himself to Saul, who's on his way to apprehend and to arrest some Christians in Damascus. Uh, they've been meeting there. They have uh, the, the, the small churches were beginning to form and beginning to become very effective in the, in the life of the Jews. And, and uh, Saul, being a great um, a Pharisee, recognized the threat that the Christians posed to uh, Judaism. And so he uh, got permission, uh, and in fact, encouragement from the leaders, the Sanhedrin and others. Uh, they gave him uh, uh, actually a writing, uh, could have been a warrant to go and to uh, really um, take care of these Christians, to, um, to quiet them down a bit and arrest them and bring them in. Uh, and, and, and Saul is uh, involved in this, in this process, and he's an angry man, he's an angry Jew. Uh, but he'd never be the same again after this experience on the road to Damascus. At the beginning of this story, Saul's pursu pursuing those who uh, he thought were enemies of God. But I think we find out then later on in the passage and in the many stories that follow that Paul, who thought these people were the enemies of God, he himself uh, was an enemy of God. So there, there's a couple of visions in this story, uh, and one is, of course, the, the great vision to Saul, uh, and then there's another vision where Ananias is given a vision, and, and God is working through his, uh, uh, to, uh, him, you know, to move uh, individuals at this point in time through the uh, vision uh, process. The, the one Saul vision that Saul gets is, is brief and to the point. Uh, Luke is very sparse in his writings. His, he's a doctor. So it's, it's a, a dialogue here, and it's, it's a brief a dialogue with Paul, with Saul, rather. Why do you persecute me? Saul's a bit puzzled. He responds with his own question. Who are you, Lord? Uh, of course, the word Lord here is a common uh, Aramaic word for sir. So this was a, uh, a, a bit of respect by Saul that he was paying for this, uh, to, to this voice. And the voice answers, I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. So, and this must have really confused Saul because 
he was after believers. He was after the followers of the way. The early Christians were called the, the people of the way. And the, Saul was after these people. And Jesus was dead after all in, in, in Saul's mind. But uh, he was, so he was not after Jesus per se. And so that was confusing to Saul. Uh, of course, later on, Saul learns that uh, Jesus and his followers are one and the same people. The next word from Jesus to Saul in this vision on the road is, it's a bit of a dual command to Saul. He says, get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. It looks like this conversion for Saul is not simply about conversion, but it's also a statement of vocation. So Saul is not only called uh, to be tra transformed, but he's called to a task. Um, Saul will become uh, not only a believer, but a person with a role to play for God. Later on, we're going to discover that Ananias learns that uh, Saul's actual vocation here is that uh, he's going to be a chosen, God's chosen instrument to proclaim uh, my name to the Gentiles. Those are Luke's words. And now, after verse 6, though, in this uh, passage, Saul's no longer the great enemy of God. After this passage, from this point on, nothing about Saul will ever be the same. We can also note in this passage that uh, Saul's companions, they're there and they observe this whole thing that's gone on and they're speechless. Uh, they heard the sound, but uh, nothing else. Uh, Saul's life was changing, but the uh, onlookers there, the uh, friends that were, or the people who were with him on their uh, journey to Damascus, uh, they're, they're untouched by Saul's experience. You know, one, one can raise a question there, which is often the case uh, even today, uh, individual, uh, individual Christians may be uh, going through a, a great transformation in their life uh, as God has uh, impacted their lives and they've encountered God in different ways, but family members and friends are somehow untouched uh, by that experience. They don't understand what's going on. Uh, and I've seen a lot of that in my ministry where, where God, uh, has touched an individual and has transformed that individual. And they've now given their lives over, over to Christ and uh, they, they become zealous then in the reading of scripture and prayer and service and other family members are bewildered by the whole thing. Sometimes uh, and then from the negative side, family members even oppose what's going on and they try to convince these other family members that uh, they're, they're, they've got a, they're a mental case, that, that uh, uh, what, uh, what they perceive as God is doing is really uh, unnatural. Uh, and that's, I think that's one of the side issues that could come out of this, uh, this story this morning from Acts 9. The nature of the change in Paul is striking. He's now helpless. This tough, he's, he's really a, a religious terrorist, a persecutor of the church, bully in the worst sense of the word. He's now helpless and he's blind. The leader of this group now must become himself a follower and be led into the city. He's now like a, like a, like a little child the great persecutor of the church. It's interesting, the great persecutor of the church will now enter himself, enter the kingdom of God as a little helpless child. The words of Jesus ring in my mind and perhaps yours. Except ye become as a little child, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. 
But the narrative does not end here. God's made preparations for Saul's future work. And his preparations for Saul's future work are focused on the, uh, the, the other Christian who's uh, off, apart from Saul, his name is Ananias. And you know the rest of the story there uh, in this text. Ananias is, is called out. He's, he himself now is praying, but he has an experience with God and a vision. And Ananias is a, is a faithful follower of Jesus. And, and we all know about the concluding picture there. Um, God calls to him in, in his prayer, and Ananias says, yeah, I'm here, here I am, Lord. That, that tends to be the way folks respond to God's call uh, in the scriptures. Yeah, I'm here, I'm there. Ananias, he said, uh, I've got, got a job for you to do, okay? He said, uh, I want you to get out and go to the street called Straight. Uh, there is a, a, a street in Damascus called Straight. And he says, I want you to go to a certain home. And he says, I want you to um, look up a man by the name of, this is what the vision is, uh, the voice is saying to Ananias, I want you to look up a man named Saul. And Ananias, I could even envision him today there in prayer and the voice, he's hearing the voice and, ah, oh, yes. And as he's praying and then the voice says to him, look up a man named Saul. And I could just see Ananias now going, <laughs> what? And then his recourse, his response is, yeah, well, yeah, we've all heard about Saul and uh, what he's doing here, and he's persecuting the brothers and sisters, and he's just a, an angry old terrorist uh, bully, and he's, he's, he's a terrible person. And, and I, I know all that is going through Ananias' mind, and, and, and the Lord says, yeah, that's right but I want you to go to him because now he's the chosen vessel for me and I'm going to use him for my greater glory among the Gentiles. And so Ananias doesn't argue, but he's just a bit startled. And of course, then the story continues. Ananias goes to Straight Street and I'm sure stuff is going on in his mind. I'm not sure how eager he was to get out there and go straight to Straight Street. Uh, he may have gone out after his prayer and stopped and had a cup of coffee and a bagel or something on the way. And, uh, and he eventually got there. And I'm sure he was, uh, he was not really that uh, confident in what was going on, but he was, he was a, a willing servant of the Lord, and so he was, he was a, a, as we'd say, he was a good soldier. And he was following the Lord's orders, and he goes in, and, and, uh, and, and Saul is there, and he's blind. And he, he might have even been at that point in this place because he was led into the city now, um, by his, uh, the group he was with, they let him in, and he may have been in a small room by himself, Saul, blinded, and may have even been in a fetal position. Uh, that would have not been un unusual for that. And, and Ananias sees him there and goes in, and I'm all through all of the stuff that's going through Ananias' mind reaches out because God has asked him to heal him as well. So Ananias reaches out and touches Paul. And he says, brother Saul, brother, this enemy that he had feared so much now uh, because of God's spirit that had come upon not only uh, Saul, but upon Ananias. Uh, God's uh, great redemptive work was all taking place now in this uh, little event in Acts 9. Uh, the great enemy of, of the church, 
the great terrorist who was threatening the, the early believing Christians has now become a brother, a brother in Christ. And what wonderful words from Ananias, brother Saul. I can imagine now even the response of Saul that he was surprised. You know, why would this person that I've been, or these people that I've been persecuting and, and, and hounding down and wanting to kill and throw in the prison, why would they ever approach me, anyone ever approach me and call me a brother? But then as he was healed, and I'm sure the, the, the conversation continued, uh, Saul began to realize that what was happening to him was, was not some kind of a dream uh, or some kind of a fantasy, but it was real. And this person that came was really a representative of God Almighty and the glory of God. And his presence through Ananias uh, was just there to transform this old persecutor in the church into a loving brother and a child. It's an overwhelming, it's an overwhelming scene. The enemy becomes the brother. I think there are some lessons in here that we can learn. First, my, my first observation is this, that uh, the conversion and the radical change of Saul is something that God does and not something that Saul does. The radical change that took place is something that God does and not what Saul does. And I think those of us who ourselves this morning here followers of Jesus Christ and had a, a life-changing experience and by the way I need to say a word about this that this experience of Saul on the Damascus Road uh, is is not intended by Luke for all of us to say that we ourselves must have an experience like Saul on the Damascus Road we need to be wherever we are thinking that we need to be knocked on our face and a light shines and we hear voices telling us to do stuff. Luke had no intention of saying that Saul's experience on the Damascus Road was to be a norm for every Christian conversion. That's not the case. Uh, Saul's uh, case was a very special a very peculiar case and God used that experience in a very special way because he was calling this persecutor of the church Saul to become an apostle he was calling Saul to become an apostle and that was a unique call to Saul if we read the variety of conversion experiences that are noted throughout the Bible you'll see that they're all different they're all different and we should never assume that just because one person has had one one experience with God and has whom God had called him into the kingdom that therefore our own personal experience of God should be in the same manner and that is not the case that's not the case every God uh, does not respect uh, respects our personhood he respects our individuality he calls us all individually by name um, I would never expect any other person that I've ever met to come up to me and tell me the story of their conversion and say, oh yeah, I was in a German army, uh, army chapel too. Uh, and, and I heard this uh, great evangelistic sermon by a, a chaplain named Griffin. And uh, I, I too was called forward that felt like somebody grabbed me by the shoulder and took me up and threw me on my knees. I too had that kind of an experience, just like you, Muse. Uh, I would never expect anyone to come up to me and say that kind of thing happened to me. Uh, and so there are all of these experiences, all of our experiences are different. 
there are some common, uh, or at least I think there's a, a common factor that is uh, to be noted among all Christian conversions. And it's simply this, it's simply this, that an individual has a personal encounter with the living, loving God who calls us into a special relationship with him, with himself, and will not allow us to be left to our own uh, failures and our own, uh, our own sins and our own struggles. He will, God will not leave us to that. He encounters us all individually and personally in a very personal way. And he's a loving God who has come to, to, to uh, forgive us of our sins and, and set us on a new path in the right direction. Those are the commonalities that we see in conversion. But back again now to this, uh, the radical change is again, is not uh, done by Saul himself. It's something that God does. And all this is a gift. It's a gift to Saul. He realizes that more and more as his life progresses, he realizes how much his transforming experience was a gift of God, a free gift of God's grace. And so he writes about that over and over and over again in his letters, a free gift of God's grace into my life and into the other people's lives. The sparse language is here again. He says, uh, Saul says later in his, Gal his Galatian letter that, and these are simply the words that, that he wrote uh, in a very simple way. He said, when he talks about his own conversion experience, he says, God chose to reveal his son to me. That, those were his simple words, and that's all he said. And so when you begin to think about it, this revelation was really a strange gift, although it was a gift, a strange gift to Saul because it meant for Saul a lot of suffering and pain which will accompany the gift for Paul. Also, we might, we might wonder here for a moment why, why God chose to pick this militant terrorist persecutor to become his own chosen instrument. I think such questions of God usually prove to be stupid and ignorant questions. For you see, I believe that God chooses whom he chooses. It's his choice simply because He's God. From the beginning of Hebrew history, the question of chosenness has been raised by scholars and debated across the, uh, the globe. And of all the peoples of the earth, the question is, is raised. Why would God choose a motley, lowly bunch of slaves and servants and no, no, no good folks like these Hebrews to be his chosen people. And God answers, why not? Why not? I'm God. I make the choices all the time. That's my middle name, God the chooser. I choose. I don't need any reason. I choose because that's who I am. So Saul joins then a long list of nasty liars and reprobates. Think Jacob. And murderers. Think Moses. And think about Simon the Zealots, whom Jesus chose randomly, no? He chose this Simon the Zealot, who was a revolutionary, who wanted to drive the Romans out of Israel by force. In modern day, think of the person named Chuck Colson, uh, Nixon's hatchet man and lawyer, 
Uh, think about God choosing him, uh, this nasty man who eventually was uh, one of the few of Nixon's people that en ended up and went to prison. Uh, and, and Colson uh, later became a, a follower of Jesus through, uh, through a friendship with, uh, with one of the uh, individuals in Washington that, uh, that uh, usually uh, led the uh, prayer breakfast. Uh, Chuck Colson uh, met Christ and his life was transformed. And if you ever get a chance, you should read through his book called Born Again. Remember, he's the one who's started and has been in, encouraging and had been during his lifetime since passed away, uh, the, the prison fellowship ministry. He's done wonderful things with that. So, but why would God choose these kinds of people? Well, you know, you wonder about that, but on the other hand, uh, you remember that, well, God is God and, and, and I'm not God, you're not God, and God is the one who makes those choices. And that uh, we shouldn't waste a whole lot of time wondering why he makes those choices, but they tend to turn out to be good choices. My second observation, and uh, we're, we're drawing close here, my second observation is this, that this kind of conversion involves a pilgrimage from self-confident independence toward childlike dependence. The one who knows so much must become the one who knows nothing. The one who is the leader must be the one who then becomes led and he becomes healed and he's fed and instructed by the very ones he once hated. This, I'm sure it must have been for Paul a very painful or Saul a very painful, confusing interim period of his life and it turns uh, uh, to become, uh, he has to become like a little child, a little child. One scholar suggested this, we, we progress by regression and we go forward by falling backward. Remember Jesus' words, he who loses his life will what? will gain it. So the, the, result of all, the result of all this helplessness and bafflement now is, is a new birth. And for one Saul, the beginning of wisdom. So Saul, who is also called Paul by God's plan, Saul is the Hebrew name, Paul is the Latin name. Uh, God has work for Saul. He is to be now the bridge between Jew, Saul, and Gentile, Paul. Now this leads me to suggest to you this final thought. Like Ananias, we modern disciples must be ready to be surprised by God's transformational work of our enemies into our brothers and our sisters. We gotta get ourselves ready for that because it seems to me that's what God is about. Uh, if we had time and if this were a class today, I'd have you get into smaller groups and I'd have you list or write a list of the names of the people. Now I know you would be hesitant to, to name people, but you could do it privately yourself. Uh, the list of names of people that you may not want to call them enemies, but people you would say, well, but they might be a borderline enemy. To get you to make a list of those names and then think on this, uh, how would you handle them if they come to you one day as a brother in Christ? 
So we need to be, I think, as Christians and as a church, ready to be surprised by God's transformation of our enemies into our brothers and our sisters. For we may never know uh, who may be the next recipients of the mysterious, inscrutable choices of our God, the way he chose Saul, who became then the great apostle Paul. We need to be ready for those kinds of surprises in our life, not only individually, but as a church. Are you ready? Are you ready? Amen. Amen. And amen. Let's conclude this morning with our final hymn, number 451, I Surrender All. 451. some kind of a change take place in my life or in someone else's life to make this relationship better. Just think on this. Pray on this for just a moment. And, and if God has touched your heart in a special way like that, I may, not, I may never be standing here again before you. I'm 86 years old. 
I, I don't know how many more times I'm going to have an opportunity to be here standing before you. And, but it's not about me. It's, it's about a message that the Lord has laid on my heart for you. And I'm not saying that to embarrass anybody, but just remembering what Billy Graham always said. Billy said, whether it's in a big meeting or it's a small Bible study, I always conclude my meetings with a, an opportunity for someone to make a decision. Um, whether or not this morning is the time for you to do that, I don't know. But I want to sing the, 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 the chorus again to this. And, and as the Lord has laid on your heart, uh, you, you talk to the Lord now and, and, and ask Him to straighten this out for you. Uh, and if in the singing of this final hymn, if any of you feel that you want to come up or you don't even have to do it while we're here, if you want to hang around for the end and, and talk to me or talk to one of our deacons, I or we would be happy to pray with you and even if you want to come up front and kneel, we can, we can deal with that. So, but please, uh, don't, don't leave this morning without having dealt with this question, if, it's a, if it is an important question to you. So let's sing one more time this chorus and this wonderful mm -hmm. church, especially into the life of this church. You are the God who will begin to change things. And Lord, we ask simply that you would begin to change them right now and with us and particularly with me until we wait upon you and we go out now with uh, with joy, and we go out with thanksgiving. We go out in praise to your name, in the name of Jesus, and for his sake, in the power of the Spirit, we go forth. And God's people all said together then, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. And Amen. Hallelujah. God be with you. Have a great day.